a countdown. And it says I'm recording, Freddie. Good afternoon. Welcome. Good morning. Oh, good evening, even. Um, welcome to our latest webinar on uh, rem uh, remote learning. This is, uh, we are talking about encouraging and empowering your community today. My name is Sarah Marshall and I'm here um, representing BET. BET is the biggest education community in the world. Um, we run shows in uh, five countries and we are really happy to have you here today. Um, we have a number, of, a number of elements I'd love to share with you. First of all, we have a chat function that you can see at the top of the screen. Please do say hello in the chat function and um, let us know where you're coming from and what's, uh, what you'd like to hear about. We have a question and answer session as well. So please do, uh, please do add your questions in there and we will do our very best to get to those. Um, welcome from Malaysia. Hi, Anza, Asma, welcome. So pleased to have you here. Hi from the Philippines. That's absolutely wonderful. Lebanon, the UK, Germany, Brazil, Denver, Egypt, Pakistan, Kyrgyzstan. That's excellent. We're so pleased. BET really is a global community. And uh, we hope today that our speakers will be able to answer some of your challenges. I see Greece. I see Saudi Arabia. I see Bahrain. So uh, welcome to everybody. So um, first of all, what I'd like to do is um, uh, you will see the couple of questions coming up onto your screens. If you have a moment to answer those, we'd be really grateful if you could let us know and then we can see what the, what the results are and how that affects, whether that affects things differently in different countries. But for now, what I'd like to do is uh, let our speakers introduce themselves. Um, one, uh, so first of all, we have Ben, and then we have Donna and then Dr. Fay, who is going, are all going to just tell you a little bit about their journey to online uh, during these last few months. Uh, ben, over to you. Um, so I will say good morning because I'm in Philadelphia, but uh, good evening, good afternoon, um, everywhere. Uh, everywhere else. Um, my name is Ben Jacobs. I'm from Infobase. Um, uh, I'm not an I'm not an educator per se, but I'm a publisher. Um, Infobase is, um, has been providing online resources to schools for over 20 years, um, including our streaming video, databases, and eBooks. And um, really, um, our sort of journey um, throughout the COVID crisis has been working with institutions, kind of really starting starting at about the end of January when we got word from our from the first of our subscribing schools in um, in China and, and Asia that they would not be coming back after Chinese New Year um, and then sort of following through um, I think the Middle East were some of the next schools to close down um, through Europe, um, obviously the United States, um, sort of working with schools and edu ed educators all over the place. I personally have been working with online resources um, since 1998 when I started at Infobase. Um, we were facts on file then, and we were doing ebooks. Um, we were doing those first early handheld ebooks. Um, and then we sort of started doing some of our resources in an online format. In 2012, we went to strictly online, um, and along the way, we rolled in a lot of video resources and streaming video. Um, it's been a really an evolutionary process, um, and and you know, this this um, this webinar is so exciting to me because I think that um, for a lot of our a lot of the customers, a lot of the subscribers, partners that we've had long time relationships with, um, have you know have long been proponents of, of of using online resources, but potentially have belonged to communities that were a little bit more um, a little more uh, reticent to use them. So the idea of sort of taking what we've learned from this current crisis and saying, okay, you've used these things, you know, because you had to, but now don't you want to, um, and, and sort of taking it from there. So with that, um, um, 
that's kind of my introduction and I'll, I'll leave it over to um, um, back over to Sarah to, to, to bring Great. on the next. Thanks, Ben. Um, Donna, do you want to introduce yourself and what? Sure. Tell us sure. about you. Of course. Um, so my name is Donna Saxby. I've been a librarian for 25 years now. Um, I'm also a Google educator uh, level one and two. Um, I worked at the International School of Amsterdam for 11 years um, before my current place. Um, ISA, if you've ever been to it, is a very technologically rich school. It's a uh, full IB international school of a thousand kids. Um, I moved back to the UK um, eight years ago now uh, to a school called Kingham Hill, which is about as opposite to ISA as you can get, but that's very exciting. Um, I would say the nicest way to put it was that they're te technology reluctant um, in some parts. Um, we have some teachers that absolutely love to use technology and some that don't. Uh, we also have a homework policy which dictates that um, devices can't be used uh, for homework, uh, which uh, has a knock-on impact on independent learning. Um, so that's our kind of background. Uh, before virtual KHS, only about a quarter of teachers uh, use technology frequently. Um, and now, of course, they've had to do this massive jump to pretty much um, only using technology. Um, I also, by the way, teach um, digital literacy to years seven and nine, so that's grades uh, six and eight um, as well. Um, and that's embedded uh, project work, uh, working with different teachers in collaboration. Uh, our virtual learning started on the very first Monday after lockdown. Um, we pretty much checked to the timetable and tried to reflect as much as of real school life as possible. Um, our SMT were actually brilliant about a giving a really clear message to pupils and staff of what was happening. Uh, and I was also made part of IT support. So any questions that came in to do, particularly with Google Classroom, I would, uh, or Google Suites, uh, I would be fielding them and helping IT support. Um, we had one training, mad training session uh, on the Friday of lockdown. Uh, after the kids are gone, the, all the teachers met in the library, and we just did like, uh, uh, like everything you need to do know about uh, classroom and meets in about half an hour. Uh, so that was the training for staff. So they did need um, support and uh, guidance, uh, which um, I and the IT support guys provided. Um, so I, I would say it's been pretty successful. Uh, we found overall the majority of kids have got their digital skills got better and same with the teachers um my concern has been uh that and with teach from teachers as well is that the gap between the very able kids and the um the ones that may be a bit less weak or a bit less keen self-motivated has widened and, and i think that's something that we need to think um about um so that's me basically thank you um, Dr. Fay. Hello, good evening. My time to everyone who has joined us from around the world. And um, good morning and good afternoon to you all uh, as per your time zone. Uh, thank you for having me in the session today. And I'm really honored to be part of this uh, webinar today. Um, a little background about myself. Uh, I'm an architect and a planner by profession. And I was recently appointed in October last year as the director of e-learning at the University of Bahrain. Uh, to my luck, during the, the situation uh, shortly after COVID-19 happened, and all of our aspirations to go online and to encourage faculty to uh, to use more of our digital learning platforms and learning management system has, you know, become a reality in a very short time. Uh, the first case of COVID-19 in Bahrain uh, presented itself on the 21st of February and shortly after, on the 25th, the government announced the, the shutdown of all educational institutions and we had to deal with the situation to check our infrastructure and check um, that we are capable to bring everyone online and to resume teaching uh, from a distance uh, based on online learning. So we did the following and um, a little bit about our digital transformation journey. What helped us a lot is being prepared for this uh, even before COVID-19 happened. So we, uh, we, what we wanted to do is to encourage faculty to use more of our learning management system. 
So we offered all of the courses online and, and enrolled all of the students automatically into the system, which I think had helped us a lot during COVID-19. Uh, a little bit about the University of Bahrain, we have um, a little short than 25,000 students and um, a little bit shy than 900 faculty. So it's a large number to bring online uh, in a very short time. Uh, we were, of course, we had the learning management system at the University of Bahrain since 2009, so it's nothing new to us, but not everyone was using it. Uh, and we're using Blackboard in addition to uh, Microsoft uh, 365 Suite, which has Microsoft Teams in it, which we were able to use as a communication tool effectively. Uh, so we formed a lot of committees so quick, the Digital Transformation Committee um, in, in the university, and then smaller committees in each college to help the faculty um, uh, get educated about the, the learning management system and what they're supposed to, to do and not to do during the, the situation. And also there was a lot of uh, debates and uh, throughout the committees and we drafted uh, some guidelines for the faculty to, to use throughout the, uh, that period. Of course, we had to revise uh, our grading system, our assignment and assessment system. Uh, we were luckily be, we were luckily able to transfer most of our courses online, but some practical courses were really hard to go online. You know, like physical education courses or health related courses. But in general, I think um, we had a very nice and very challenging digital transformation journey with the University of Bahrain, and I'm happy to be here today with you to to talk about it. That's Thank wonderful. You. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Anurag, over to you. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, everyone. It's uh, 5, 5, 12 p.m. in Stockholm, so <coughs> good evening, and at the time of the day, wherever you are, uh, most welcome. Uh, my name is Anurag Chaudhary, and I'm working as a technology integrator at Stockholm International School at the moment, and my background has been uh, of math teachers, special ed teacher, and, and as well as I have worked with uh, tech startups in Stockholm, uh, those who are working in the ed tech field, helping them develop the products for education. Uh, just a short background of our school. We are an international school with uh, presenting 60 nationalities, uh, 650 students, 150 staff. So I would say uh, moderately sized international school based in Stockholm. And since 2010, we have been a one-to-one -one device school. That means every student has an access to a mobile device. And in secondary, they can take them home as well. So primary has iPads and secondary school students have a combination of Chromebooks and uh, MacBooks and all our staffs, including maintenance, kitchen support staff, they all have access to uh, a laptop that they take home. So in terms of uh, infrastructure, we have been ready. And for past two years, we uh, developed uh, uh, a, a IP driver's license for our staff so that we wanted everyone to have a base set of uh, skills, uh, technical skills that uh, they should possess in order to impart teaching in 2020 uh, or in 21st century. So in that case, and we have also been trying to practice a snow day or we have been part of this overseas uh, departments, international schools, where we need to have a plan in place in case we need to shut down the campus, be it uh, any unforeseen reasons, be it a fire or earthquake or, you know, um, you can imagine. But uh, this COVID made it real in such a short time. So when it struck, we had a bit of a practice because uh, in this part of the world, yes. we have something called sports break in February where people go skiing on Alps. And that time, COVID had already hit Europe. So some of the people, when they came back, so they self-isolated themselves for two weeks. So we had a, a little bit of experience of this hybrid model. So we were having students in school and uh, we were teaching online as well, which was a big strain uh, on our teachers. So as we were learning, we had to sort of go fully uh, remote learning model for uh, six weeks, even though the rest of the Sweden was not closed. But uh, the nature of our school meant that our community was mobile and more at risk. So hence, we did that. Uh, and again, I'm just digressing a little bit. Our ed tech department, which has both pedagogical aspect and infrastructure side of it. So in our school, we have two library media specialists, two technology integrators. And on the infrastructure side, we have uh, an IT manager, operations person, uh, a technical support person, and network administrator. So operationally, we were ready. So everyone uh, um, had their devices, and Stockholm usually have a good internet speed. Uh, so that was not an issue. However, we had to impart 
three years worth of training in three days to lots of our staff. And we had to, uh, the first week was a lot of adrenaline and enthusiasm. Everyone was trying to use as many digital resources as they could. But quickly we realized that it was not sustainable and we pivoted to using the very basic ones. And throughout the journey, we also identified what are the core, uh, we have to remind ourselves we are in, in a pandemic and uh, it's a crisis. So we can't expect our students, our teachers to sort of uh, really everything that they would do under normal circumstances. So we had to do a lot of re-evaluation while we were going through it. So that enthusiasm uh, sort of pivoted to some more balanced approach of uh, uh, shortening the workload and all. Uh, so it was, it has been a very intense journey and we are still sort of recovering from it. Now summer holidays have started uh, and it worked a bit differently. In primary, we had a combination of uh, synchronous and asynchronous learning, which means that we didn't have so many live sessions, but so that fam families could have time to plan uh, at the, on their own. However, in the high school, we replicated the entire schedule that they would have had had they been to the campus. So everything was streamed live. And the platforms we already had, but we, did, we had to sort of review our policies, keeping in mind GDPR. Now kids are taking these devices home and they're online all the time. So how it would affect their safety and our staff safety. So there were a lot of things which uh, we had to relearn, uh, even though we thought that we were quite ready. So, uh, so yeah, so this has been our, just a brief uh, snapshot of our, of our COVID journey. And uh, I'm looking forward to, yeah. Thank you. More with the panel. Great. So, so, I mean, some very different experiences of of transitioning to to online and bringing your uh, bringing your education community with you. Um, with that in mind, uh, my next question to you to you guys is: Now we're thinking of a physical return to, return to the physical classroom. What's worked well for you, and what do you want to retain from these past few months of remote learning? Would uh, if somebody would like to jump in to start with? Um. I can get going if you like. Um, I would say that the majority of teachers and pupils are really keen to be back in the physical classroom. Um, in terms of what they'll bring, I think screencasting has been an absolutely massive um, difference um, to many of our teachers. And I know myself as a teacher, I'm, I'm definitely going to be doing more of that. And I think that helps not only from a distance learning point of view, but also in terms of revision for kids, um, for supporting SEN kids, like if, they, if you know, if they need to slow down or stop you, they can. Um, and also, it just helps you look back at your own teaching as well. You kind of think, um, I, because we use Google Meets, and it sends you a recording of yourself doing the online teaching, and that makes me think about, you know, how how I, how I respond to kids, um, how I teach my pace of my lessons. So I think that that use of recording and, and screencasting is, is going to be massive um there's a big um move for the the teachers also wanting to use classroom now i think now they've actually used it and see how seen how powerful it is and how easy it is to for them to use um i think that's been great and also there's a big also um teachers are really enjoy doing quizzes so using things like kahoot as well um i do think we still need to review uh, over, overall, what resources have been used and what skills the kids need moving forward as well. So I think that's something that we probably need to look at um, as we return or as we prepare to return. Thank you. Uh, hey. If, yeah, uh, I think I'd argue from the contrary to what Donna has said, it would be very, very hard to bring the faculty back to the university now and the students now that they they saw how easy it is to attend classes <laughs> from home at their convenience, you know. So, yeah, we do have some faculty that are eager to come back, but uh, I think the majority are just, um, you know, happy about the situation that we are in, in now. Um, uh, I think we've learned from this COVID-19 experience that uh, we should really invest in our infrastructure and uh, having the right technology as part, not only as part of our contingency plan, but also our uh, as part of our continuous practice. Um, so I think we should, we will continue using uh, e-learning uh, and distance learning in a scalable manner now, now that we've uh, you know, trained everyone to use it and everyone has saw the benefits of, of uh, online learning and from learning at their own pace and learning from home and 
teaching from home. So I think uh, that would continue to be as part of our practice whether we come back fully to the campus or we continue uh, partially teaching online um, after the pandemic. Uh, I think it's also important to think of uh, digital uh, technologies as part of our contingency plan for the university very seriously. Uh, because we have never had a situation like this before and we have never been put in a situation where we need to bring 100% of our faculty and students online in a very, very short time. Uh, but uh, having known that we are able to do that and we were able to, to train everyone within two weeks and enforce everything to go online, uh, that puts us at ease that um, uh, hopefully nothing like that happens in the future, but in case something happens, we are ready and we have the capabilities and uh, both faculty and students and honestly even parents are adaptable to the change and to the new circumstances that, uh, that we are faced with. Uh, I think one good lesson uh, that we have learned from the pandemic also and having to go online is that we don't need to spend as much for our conferences and training sessions that we usually conduct on site and so the, the usual practice was to rent hotel uh, you know uh, halls and spend money on food and uh, and you know to invite the speakers to come to speak and now that we are forced to put everything online i think that made things much more convenient for everyone to organize and and put in place so I think it should be in the long-term strategy of the university to continue having its conferences and webinars online rather than to uh, you know, waste money and effort and, uh, and resources into having people uh, physically on site every time. Uh, I'm sure that some of the events will have to be conducted on site, but uh, I'd like to see more of the online uh, events happening as well. Um, uh, the last thing that I, I'd like to comment on, on, on on the things that we would like to continue is to have those digital transformation committees uh, at the university because I think when, when you have uh, committees that are ensuring our digital transformation at a smaller scale in the departments and colleges and also at the university level, it encourages us to think of uh, alternative solutions and to push us to advance ourselves um, in employing technology in our teaching practices. So that was it with me. Thank you. Uh, who would like to go? Anurag? Yeah. Uh, so what made us uh, survive it, survive it, this whole uh, COVID experience? I think, as I mentioned before, we already had a comprehensive tech training program in place for our staff. And we have a culture of uh, using regular workshop for our students to introduce new uh, new tools and also we involve families as well so we have monthly workshop with the families in uh, all aspects uh, covering digital citizenship and also how to use uh, technology at home so that there's a uh, consistent message to our students so in that sense operationally we were ready however another learning was that uh, all the adaptation we have been doing in a classroom setting for example we all use a lot of technology when we are teaching face to face and the way we use technology and adapt curriculum when we went completely remote learning so that was uh, that's something that we had to uh, learn and we this is something we'll continue to work uh, uh, work towards when we uh, return after the summer break and also other thing uh, everyone realized that why these trainings programs have been in place and i think from the leadership point uh, we were fortunate that there was an alert and decisive leadership and uh, all the messages have been confirmed all the tech ex tech expectations have been put in place and everyone knew what was expected of them for example for last two years we had told everyone that within two years all our stuff would be google educator level one and apple teacher because if you're using apple devices so those two were the basic uh, i'm just giving you one small example of the tech expectation that they can use anywhere in the world and based on the programs and year level they're teaching other tech goals were put in place for all the staff and their line managers and their professional development coordinators were coordinating that so we had invested time so what we realized that all that time invested was really worthwhile and we will continue to double up on that so i feel training and in our previous talk um, uh, in our rehearsal talk, I was just talking and I gave an analogy of, uh, you know, you need to do fire drill before the fire starts because you can't learn how to do that while fire is going on. 
And uh, another uh, analogy I like to give to my colleagues that you all have been given a car. You just need to know how to drive it in different conditions. You don't need to know how the motor works. You don't need to know, you don't have to be the automobile engineer. But if you have a tool, you need to know at least the basics of it so you can survive and it will save you a lot of time. Um, so those are the two main things I would emphasize on and having a uh, clear communication, deciding it together, what are the tech goals, what are the, you know, uh, for our community is and how we are going to reinforce it during the time of crisis or otherwise. So this is something we will uh, uh, continue to work on. And as I mentioned, we'll have to be a bit more innovative in finding good digital resources, which are more adaptable for remote teaching. For example, in a classroom teaching, a professor or a teacher can use a very good Prezi uh, slides or presentation, but that might not work equally well in a remote setting. So we'll have to find more personalized tools where students can choose how they're going to do their work without compromising the quality. Yeah. Um, so Ben, coming to you uh, and sort of keeping on that point of resources, what's um, what have your clients found most valuable and what what do you what do you predict will be coming back coming back into the classroom with them um well i think that you know it's interesting i mean for us over the past couple of months uh, a lot of what we've been doing is helping the the educators that we work with who in many cases are on the library side to help them pivot with the resources that they have in to help them pivot from being library resources to being teaching resources. And I think, you know, also along with what you just said, um, I think, you know, absolutely streaming video. Um, you know, that, that you know, that um, to, help, to help educators take the video resources that they, that they have available to them um, in school, um, uh, you know, like um, our, our films on demand on the academic side, our Learn360 and classroom video on the, on the school side, to help them take those resources and to integrate them into their learning management systems in a way that um, it really kind of um, you know, enables blended learning. Um, it really makes it so that they can take these resources, students can use them in the way that they need to use them um, and that they're always available to, to, to the students and to the faculty. Um, that's where sort of, you know, a, a lot of times, you know, you'd see in the past, you'd see faculty using a, a YouTube video and you know, they, they try and bring it up in class. And if it didn't come up, oh, we'll find something else. Um, Cause oftentimes YouTube stuff gets moved around or whatever. Um, so, but you know, having the, those streaming video resources and likewise, you know, our, our our, our literary resources, our Blooms literature, our databases, our science online resources, um, helping them, helping, helping the educators to, to find ways to use them and embed them into their into their digital learning plans, um, so that they're always available to students. Um, I think that's really has been a big part of it. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so, you've you've spoken of of people wanting people enjoying and, and people enjoying the remote teaching and learning and, and probably wanting to retain quite a, a part of this. Um, but what about the, the reluctant, the reluctant adopters who found this a difficult transition? And um, mm. I, my question to you would be, how do we ensure that these people uh, re remain engaged with, with this new way of working? And what do we need to put in place to support them? If you allow me to start on this. Uh, thank you, Faye, thank you. Yeah, uh, I think uh, there's always a percentage of, of our faculty who would be not really willing to, to move online as, as smooth as and fast as, as others. Now we have different generations, and I'm talking about university professors who are used to do things in a certain way for, for years and years, and they're not really um, used to adapting to change uh, so fast. But I think luckily because of the COVID-19 and because there was no other option but to do this, uh, we had, uh, you know, we had transformed dramatically in that sense. And even our reluctant adopters, as you have mentioned, uh, were able to change fast. Now to continue doing this, 
in the future, I think it would be much easier now that they have learned the technology and tried the technology. So this resistance to change would be anyway lighter because now they are familiar with it. Usually you have resistance to change when you're not familiar with, with whatever you're dealing with. But now that they got familiar, it would be much easier. But I think it's also very important to embed this in the evaluation system uh, and, uh, and keep that as an integral part of it. Because when you evaluate yearly our faculty uh, based on their advances and uses of the digital technologies, that gives them a, an incentive. Uh, and I think working on the incentives and competitions as well that we could do uh, internally or compete with uh, regionally or internationally certainly pushes the faculty to, uh, even if they are reluctant to the use of those technologies, to think about, uh, about ways where they can use them. Uh, and also, I think integrating and using uh, several systems together, like the student information system, along with the learning management system, along with the communication tools to, that we have at the university, if they were better integrated together, that would make things much easier to the faculty. And then they would understand why it's just easier for them to continue using it, rather than go back to traditional modes of, of teaching. Um, and I also think it's the pressure from the students that pushes faculty to also use those technologies. So sometimes it's a bottom-up approach. So when the students are interested in them and they insist on having them as part of their educational process, then the faculty becomes aware that it is a necessity for, for the century to be able to use those technologies in classrooms. So back to you, Sarah. Thank you. Anurag, do you have a something would you like to add something here yeah when it comes to uh, uh, reluctant uh, adopters uh, like this whole covid crisis made it uh, uh, in a way it forced everyone to be uh, quick learners and at the same time uh, one small example from our school that we have a lot of support staff and uh, who are very much uh, involved in the physical environment taking care of the students taking them from one place a to place b uh, helping them uh, during the lesson times, PHE activities, and so on and so forth. So they had to remotely teach them, train them how to use certain tools so that they could help remotely to their classroom or homeroom teachers because the workload was always piling up. So uh, uh, there has to be a combination of uh, uh, policy decision and also to show them how their life is going to be easier uh, using certain tools. And uh, at, at the same time, if everyone has like a basic know-how and after that it's up to inspiring them how to use it to make the whole learning experience a bit better. For example, like we are in this webinar now, uh, lots of uh, reluctant adopters just told us to our ed tech and IT team, just tell me how to stream my lessons through Classroom and that's it. And they would have like a whiteboard in the background and they would do all the teaching. They would replicate the Classroom to the Google Meet or Google Hangouts. And then we had, on the other hand, in primary, we used uh, Seesaw, which was very handy. That uh, there were all those who were previously they have been reluctant and shy towards technology but they self-taught themselves to do fancy video editing and they became a brilliant content creator so they were posting art videos the how-to videos for their younger students some assistants were recording story sessions so there were lots of examples where they saw the value if they see the value then the reluctance disappears a little bit and now the challenge for us is that how to bring it in the autumn so we can have this combination we can use it uh, on a neat basis so uh, and having said that uh, i would re-emphasize on the aspect that we all as educating educator community and tech community need to do is uh, how shall we teach in uh, how should we you know the ways of teaching that can be delivered remotely in a manner that doesn't put extra stress either on the teacher when it comes to preparation and also on students when it comes to delivering what mm -hmm. they are supposed to because uh, this is something we all have to learn and share with each other as we move forward donna yeah um from a kind of more supporting point of view um i, I try and keep everything really simple uh and quite personal um and also just making sure every, everything's relevant so some things that i will share with teachers will be um quite general but other, other times it will be very subject specific um i try not to overload people with email so i kind of just try to do um maybe two a week at the beginning and it's kind of tailed off now um but just with updates about uh resources or uh, new things 
uh, come out from uh, different tools, or maybe I've just come up with a different way of uh, something that I think is a good solution to a problem that I've heard other people, that a number of people have had. Um, I've always just made a point of also going back to people. So when I think I've kind of fixed the problem for them, just getting back to them and um, you know seeing how it's going. Do you need any more help? Because I think that also encourages um, people and. As you guys have both said, just trying to emphasize um, uh, kind of taking taking the pressure off people rather than loading them on with more work. Um, we're looking at um, training over the summer. I'm just thinking how I can put together some training stuff for teachers to do over the summer um, to just boost up their, their classroom skills. I've had quite a few uh, request for video video editing, which is not my thing, so I will have to train myself on that first. Um, and um, I just think, from from our point of view, it's re we're a very school, small school, and everyone knows everyone else. And I'd, I guess, uh, as Dr. Faye was saying, if if you're in a um, and and Anurag as well was saying, if you're in a bigger place, then you you kind of spread it out between you. So that kind of tight teamwork and collaboration. And um, I certainly talk to our IT support a lot about problems that people are having so just having that really good communication as well I think that really helps teachers and making making sure that they're um, born in mind all the time thank you um, Ben do you want, do you want to jump in um, I think just one thing just to point out which is you know in terms of taking it back in the fall or whatever I mean I, I think that that something else that um, you know I'm definitely seeing from from some institutions I'm working with is, you know, the idea that, well, although everybody's planning on being back in the classroom in the fall, um, that, that what that actually means um, is, 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 is going to vary location by location. And um, for example, um, you know, some 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 institutions are encouraging faculty to sort of to prepare some lessons in advance for kind of asynchronous learning, um, so that they don't have to scramble if if the if if it, if if schools are if if all of a sudden there's um, 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 uh, an uptick in 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 COVID in 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 a, in a locale. Um, actually, I just learned a word this morning, um, uh, recrudescence, which is the word um, that means um, um, a relapse in a, in a location or something. I, I just learned that today. Um, but, it, but if there is an uptick and the school has to sort of pivot to, um, to going back to online learning to make it a little bit easier, um, have, some of, have some of those preparations done in advance, um, which means actually, um, you know, in terms of talking to your faculty um, and your teachers, um, saying, "Well, why don't you plan to use? Why don't you plan this part of your lesson to be done online anyway? So that, that way, if if we have to switch, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's done for you." Um, so I think that's something that I'm definitely have seen. Great. Thank you. Um, and thank you to everyone who's uh, watching and listening because we've got some fabulous questions coming through on the Q&A tabs. Please continue to up um, vote those, those. And I'm going to turn to them now, actually. So, uh, Michaela Sorrentino, thank you for your question. You've asked, how do we encourage our community to try new platforms that are not Microsoft or Google? Uh, are there alternatives that you have tried or that you're aware of that work globally? Um, any 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 pointers? Um, well, we're using Blackboard at the University of Bahrain, uh, which is different. We're also using Microsoft 365 uh, suit, but uh, because we're a university, we have to use a learning management system rather than um, a communication tool. And we have benchmarked all of these systems, about 68 systems globally, and we found out that the better suited one is Blackboard for the University of Bahrain. Um, and I just want to comment as well that every context has their best suited uh, learning management system because of the uh, technical support that they have provided for that system locally. And it just happens that the support of Blackboard in the region is, uh, is better. 
uh, we wanted to adopt um, other learning management systems, but because the representation regionally is not that uh, strong, uh, we have we have opted to use Blackboard since two, since, two, since uh, 2009 in the University of Bahrain. So about 16 years of implementation of the same system. We found it um, useful. That's used to the person who asked the question. That's gr that's great. Thank you. Do, does anybody else want to jump in? We had experience of other platforms. Um, only that I would just say I don't think. You, need, you should really be overcomplicating things for people in that in a way it's much easier for staff and pupils just to stick with one thing and then as they become more confident try other platforms not quite sure if they're talking about uh, a whole learning management system or just some tools or not um, obviously there's lots of different tools that you can use and I think people will probably explore them as I go on. I mean, if you want an example of those, in my classes we've used uh, Canva for creating uh, leaflets uh, and Pixlr for image ed editing, if you're looking for something like that. Um, but I, I would say don't, don't expect teachers to learn yet more and more skills. Um, I think that's just putting too much on them. And when they're ready and able, they will move on to that. And as you're kind of star teachers, the ones that are really tech and really enjoy that that kind of use of technology, um, as they produce things, they'll share that and people then will really engage, I hope. Thank you. Um, that's great. So uh, perhaps content trumps platform. Um, so a, a question from Teresa Jacobs here. How do you think a move to online learning will affect the pricing and value proposition of education? Um, if online is less expensive, might there might students and parents wish to pay the same fees? Does uh, anyone want to jump in on that one? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 um, Sorry, did I, I say that out loud? <laughs> um, that's a great question. I, I think um, from a parent's point of view, uh, my, my daughter goes to a state school and we've really struggled with um, homeschooling because there's been very little. And when I compare that to the experience of pupils at, at Kingham, uh, who in the, in the most part have actually engaged really well um, with their learning and have um, really benefited for the effort that the teachers and the um, SNT have put into making it work. Um, I could see why if someone could afford it, they would actually choose, actually almost the opposite, they would actually choose um, private school um, rather than state school. Um, so I don't know, you could, you could argue, as is a boarding and day school, you could argue um, that the fees should be reduced. Um, uh, and I guess that's up to the individual school whether they um, are able to do that. They still need to pay the staff and um, and other responsibilities that uh, goes with the running the school. Uh, okay. If I may add to that, sorry, go ahead. No, no Dr. Fay, you go ahead. I'll catch up after you. This has been um, a very strong debate in the media and behind lately because uh, parents have been asking schools to reduce the fees since everyone is online and at home and learning. And the parents are more, certainly more involved in the teaching than, than the past because mm -hmm. they have to be at home with their, with their kids, teaching them the lessons that are being uploaded online by the teachers. And um, I think um, we have to look at this from a different point of view. Now, in Bahrain, we have the different circumstances because the government has subsidized uh, a lot of that for the private school. So we have public and, and private schools in Bahrain, which are the states in private schools as well. And um, because the government has paid all of the electricity fees and all of the salaries of Bahrainis or locals who work at those private schools, uh, then there's no reason for the school to still uh, charge the parents the same amount of money that they used to charge before because they're, they're, they're giving uh, money by the government uh, for the teachers and for the, the electricity, which they're not using anyway now because, of the, because no one's going to the school. 
and even the small percentage of uh, staff that does go, I mean, it's uh, they're, they're being covered already by the government. So in such circumstances, I would assume that they should reduce the fees, uh, but for other institutions, and we, we had arguments in, in Bahrain, and we had some uh, news coming up that, that uh, parents are moving their kids from uh, from private schools to state schools just because it's the same now, they're all online and they're learning the same material, so there's no reason for them to be there. But I, I think it's, it will continue to be an ongoing debate with the continue of using online education more than ever in the coming years after the, the pandemic. So I think um, the entire education ecosystem is going to change and, uh, and they have to adopt to that financially as well. Sorry, uh, over to you, Anwar. Yeah, since it's, uh, uh, it's not uh, our area of uh, expertise, finances, <laughs> and uh, uh, this kind of thing that taken, uh, decisions are taken <laughs> made by uh, the leadership. However, a few things that came up during the discussion in this part of the world, uh, in Scandinavia, education is subsidized and up to grade nine is compulsory. So everyone has to go and they don't pay any tuition fees. However, for the uh, private international schools, they have to charge fee just for to cover their cost and in our type of schools 90 percent of costs are fixed you are i mean the building uh, you have to pay the rent you have to uh, the cost of teachers are fixed and it's not that during this pandemic everyone went on a holiday teachers started working overtime so there was no a question of uh, uh, that discussion didn't go that far however whenever it was raised uh, uh, our leadership was very clear in communicating that why it's not feasible and uh, like, you know, certain things, certain costs, for example, extracurricular activities, they were taken off and those things which were not happening, that parents were paying extra, so they were taken off. But the core fees were there because the core costs were there and all the work was being done and even more so. And uh, that's, the, that's all I can say from uh, this part of uh, uh, experience, this part of the world. I, I just wanna I just wanna throw in, and, and this is not really, you know, this is with no professional background at all or experience in this, but I, I think that you know, one thing that I, I've seen from you know as a parent and and with you know friends who've got kids and seeing a little bit of the discussion, which is um, that you know that that the that the flip side of of the argument of well schools all online and we should be paying less is that. Um, maybe this is an opportunity where parents are seeing just how hard the teachers are working and just and in fact maybe they should be seeing that this is the time when they should be paying more um, um, I, I don't think that goes very far but I, I certainly think that in terms of the you know to use the expression you know seeing how the sausage is made um, people are, are seeing just how much goes into putting together a lesson and, and keeping their kids occupied for eight hours a day with um, with learning activities. So, An interesting point. Um, if I can move on, I'm, I'm aware we're, we're running tight on time here. Um, I think I've got time for one more question and, and that's from Amirbek um, Bektashov and he asks, how can you assess learners on online teaching? Um, would formative or summative be better for that. Oh well, certainly the, the traditional methods of assessment that we've used previously uh, had to be revised for our online environment, or to be completely dependent on our online environment. I'd say uh, I think it's very important to have the balance between formative and summative assessments in any situation, whether online or on site. But definitely, we, we have changed the way that we looked at students' attendance, for instance. So it's not as important that the student attends the class live as it is important that, that the student participates with the content that has been uploaded uh, online uh, and get the learning outcomes uh, to the students and satisfy. So once you satisfy your course and learning outcomes, um, that means the students have learned the content, whether you're using um, summative or uh, a mixture of formative and summative assessments. Now it all depends on the type of the course I would say and the subjects that you are teaching um, because that determines what kind of assessment you would want to have in that class but I think 
uh, it, it remains viable and it remains very important to use both summative and formative assessments in the classroom. Good. Interesting. Thank you. Um, Dono, Anurag, do you, do you guys have a view? Um, assessment is not something I have a great deal of involvement from. I do, when I work with teachers, I do impact to them and I do write reports, but I have to say we're pretty much all about the, the formative. It's all about how the kids can improve. So when I'm making comments, it's, it's I, I never really talk at the end of the, you know, and in, in, in my reports, I don't really talk about what they've done particularly. It's, it's more about how they can improve on what they have done, if that makes sense. Um, so I, I don't know how that, I have to think about that. I don't know how that would in, in, tie into remote learning, um, whether that makes a difference or not. But I always, I always myself as a teacher, um, uh, uh, think about how people can improve. So that's always my focus. Thank you. This was always, uh, this was always a, a concern with lots of teachers and especially based on the task. Uh, since we have, uh, uh, we had pushed for technology to be used into almost every be it summative and formative task and teachers have been using that. So the only part was that uh, depending on the task, if certain tasks could not be done remotely using technology, then we had to sort of rethink and modify the task. However, that was not the case, I would say for 98% of the tasks that were given during that time. And also we had to follow the IB uh, regulations of you know a certain number of summative tasks per term and certain number of criteria being assessed uh, um, in every subject. Great, thank you. Ben, do you, do you have a view? No, not on that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, thank you. So, um, so, and how assessment varied uh, with that summative task? Um, with just the support that was being provided remotely, then we had to modify the criteria. Otherwise, we tried our best to continue the way we were doing in a campus-based model as well. Great, thank you, thank you so much. Um, we are running out of time, and so if you permit me, I just have one more question that, that I'll ask, and that's from Linda Pengel, and that is uh, a question around digital pedagogy and um, how, how that's evolved, I suppose, and whether, you have a view on how the resources have impacted how uh, how how people are teaching. They're tricky questions. There's a challenging. Uh, <laughs> it's a very just, smart just group so today. I just, so, I just don't understand this clearly. How different technology has impacted teaching pedagogy? Well, so I think I think it's more a question around um, digital just um, how the technology has impacted the technology. Is it just, have it, has it generally been just an online version of a face-to-face -face class or, or has it, has it, have you seen teaching evolve? I think uh, there's a quite variation between online uh, resources as well themselves that help aid the uh, develop pedagogy in, in, in certain aspects. And um, I, I think the, the existence of digital technologies and the advancement of technical, digital technology has certainly advanced also pedagogy of teaching because now we are able to use uh, polls in classrooms that are easily done. Uh, we're able to, to show um, more digital content to the students like videos and ask them to interact with it in the class. So flipped classrooms as the teaching pedag pedagogy became much easier uh, to do nowadays because of digital technology. So uh, I think in terms of whether technology has affected our pedagogy, uh, yes, it did. And I think it will continue to do so in the future. That answers the question. Thank you. Anurag, would I would say, oh, oh, sorry, I'd just say very quickly is that for, for us, I think it's very early days yet and it's, it's very difficult to tell. Um, if you think that um, majority of our teachers weren't using any technology um, now, I don't think um, in the majority um, that they've changed massively what they've done. I think that is that is evolving, um, but that that's something that time will tell. So it's not very helpful. 
I would quickly add what has uh, happened that we try to, we have seen with the advent of uh, all this uh, digital technology just over the past five years or past 10 years, how it has ex accelerated and how outside the world of technology, outside the world of education, there's a view that uh, the young uh, generation, the, the kids that we teach, they are more tech savvy and, uh, you know, they use technology. Uh, at the same time, they are unable to differentiate between uh, digital consumer and the digital learner aspect of it. So I think uh, the, this has been an ongoing process and we evaluate on a, uh, there are lots of frameworks out there for you to uh, see how it is impacting, how you're using things that uh, relate to the real life. And those core concepts have always been there in uh, the whole pedagogical spectrum. However, technology has been added for them to uh, do certain things in a way that they are used to. So uh, a very small example would be, instead of writing a thousand word essay, could you make like a three minute video where you could use certain criteria? Could you make a podcast about it? You have your own channels. These things a lot of better educators are doing around the world. And uh, how it has changed the pedagogy per se, it's, uh, it has brought it a bit more closer to where how students learn, what are the things that they are comfortable expressing their knowledge with using the technology that they use to consume whether it be knowledge or entertainment. And uh, there's no one uh, silver bullet or one magic wand for, for it, but uh, both educators, parents, and uh, students, they all are learning as we go since this whole field is changing so uh, fast. And it's pretty exciting to be a part of that journey. Yep. Great. Um, so I th unfortunately, that is all we have time for today. And I would like to thank all, all of you so much for your participation. And thank you to uh, everybody who's joined us and who's participated in the chat, asked questions. I'm so sorry we haven't managed to answer all of them. We will look at them afterwards and uh, see if we can write something up to, to share. Please do uh, answer the polls if you have a moment. And please do download the handout that will give you some more information that you may uh, that that you may find useful. Uh, and I'd just like to thank in Infobase for their support of this webinar. Um, it's been a pleasure to have them with us today. Uh, so, so thank you again for your time. I wish you a very happy day. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all again on the BetCast soon. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you so much. Great. So um, I've ended this. I have a feeling we might get kicked out in.